Hi, everybody. Super excited to be here with you at the Product Dive Conference, and I can't wait to talk to you about escaping the bill trap. But before I dive into what is the bill trap, I want to tell you a little bit about how I got into product management. So I fell into product management very typically like everybody else as well. I didn't really know what I wanted to do uh, for a job, and I had been studying engineering. I'd also been working at Campus Life Marketing, and when the recruiter from Capital IQ came to campus, they said, hey, uh, you do computer science, you know how to speak to engineers, and you also know about design. You could be a product manager. And I was like, cool, what's that? <laughs> and they explained to me that my role was basically to work between the business and the engineers, take all the requirements from the business, turn them into great specification documents, and then ship them off to the engineers. And I got really, really, really good at this. I was so detailed that I actually found an early specification document about changing your login password that was 21 pages long. And everybody told me that I was a great product manager because I never had to talk to the engineers. Everything was so detailed and laid out so wonderfully that that's all it took. So I thought, man, I have really got this thing in the bag, which is fantastic. So a couple jobs later, I ended up at a startup. And uh, the CTO of Capital IQ brought me in there and he said, okay, do for me, you know, what you did at Capital IQ, make specification documents. We need some rigor here. So I did it and I got to work and I shipped off my first specification document to the engineers and I waited. And about three weeks later, they said, okay, it's ready for you to QA. And they sent it to me and I said, okay, great. I can't wait. I logged in, looked at it. And I said, guys, this isn't what I specified at all did you read my document? It was like 40 pages long. And they go, that thing? Yeah, we didn't read that. Are you kidding me? It was so long. I'm not going to go through every single piece of detail on there. I'm going to build what I wanted. So now I'm having a crisis because if I nobody's reading my specification documents, what does that mean for me as a product manager? And I didn't know what to do. We'd get into fights and I'd be like, read it. And they're like, no. <laughs> and eventually one of the engineers uh, said, hey, I wasn't brought in here just as an engineer, but I'm also brought in because I know this thing called Agile. So why don't we try it and see if it helps us work better together? And at this point, things were dire. So we were like, whatever. Okay, let's give it a shot. We will try anything at this point. So he taught us a very lightweight version of Scrum where you know I was the, the product manager. We didn't even use the product owner, owner term then, but I was the product manager. So I went through the backlog, the sprint backlog, was broken down with everybody else. And we started collaborating really well together about what we were going to ship. We did our two week sprints and we found that after a couple months, we became a really awesome team. We were working well together. We were doing like, we were delivering on what we said we were gonna deliver on and everything was going really well. So we got harder and harder projects in the company to take on because we were a great team. And I actually enjoyed working with my engineers and I loved our team that we were that we were building. So a CEO comes up to us once and he says, hey, Melissa, uh, you know, we're a, we're two sided marketplace here. We've got celebrity curators on one side. Um, they pick out products to sell to an audience that we bring to them. And then we split profits. These celebrity curators, they don't have any way to access, uh, you know, how much money they're making, figure out what products they're selling, anything like that and they're blowing up our phones, we got to create a portal for them. So we said, that's fine. And I got to work. I interviewed a bunch of celebrities, figured out what they wanted. We broke it down into sprints. And a couple months later, we released the whole thing to everybody, the first version that we had. And we said, look, it's everything you wanted. Everything you guys requested is in here. And it was the first time I'd actually used metrics ever. So we uh, never had analytics platforms back then. You know, Google Analytics was fairly new and so was Mixpanel. And I put Google Analytics on here and it was the first time I was measuring if people were using my product. And the first day, 80 curators log on and we're like, yes. Then a week goes by and the phone calls start upticking about what they were actually buying and what they were selling and all those things. And the analytics is showing that the visits are going down. I'm like, what's going on here? You guys told me you wanted all these things, what's happening? And I called the people that we were working with up and I said, you know, why aren't you logging on? Why aren't you using it? And they said, what is all of this? Like, I know I said I wanted gross profit, but I don't really care about that. I don't care about margins. I care about how much money I'm making and what I can do to share that. And that's it. Now, 
I'm having our second crisis, my second crisis as a product manager, because I realized I had been building things for years and I had absolutely no idea if anybody was actually using it. So I realized that we were stuck in something that I now call the build trap. And it's a place where a lot of companies get stuck. We're so focused on shipping and shipping and shipping that we don't stop to think about, is this the right thing to build? Is this solving a problem for our customers? And tons of companies get into this position, whether this successful today or not. It's really up to us to figure out how to get out so we don't go out of business. So before we can talk about how do we get out of the build trap, we first have to talk about how did we get into the build trap? With so many companies out there stuck here at one point or another, what's going on? And I think it's systemic. I don't think it's just one piece that's broken here. It's really a whole system contributing to it. But it goes back to this. A lot of companies mistake the quantity of ideas and how fast we can code for how much value we will produce. So they go, the more ideas we have, the faster we can code equals money. Let's just get that out of the door. So what do they do? They keep adding and adding to the backlog, but they never really take it away, anything away. And then our products turn into a hodgepodge of complexity. I mean, when was the last time you stood in front of one of these things and it actually worked? Probably not in a really long time. That's why this is still relevant from 1999. So we are just building and building, shipping and shipping, and never really taking the time to figure out, are we building the right thing? And I think that's because we missed the point of what businesses do. And we missed the point of what a product manager is supposed to do. So I like to take it all the way back to the beginning. And let's start here. We've got this value exchange system as a business where we've got customers on one side and businesses on the other. And customers have problems, wants, and needs that businesses fulfill with products and services. But it's not until those problems go away, those wants are fulfilled and those needs are fulfilled that a customer actually realizes value. There's no value inherently in a product or service itself. If you ship something, it doesn't mean it's valuable. When a customer realizes value, they give us money or some kind of business value in return and we get our business value. So. What our job is as a product manager is to figure out what are those products or services that we can release to optimize this value exchange. That's what we need to be focusing on. And we need to remember that solving big problems for customers is what creates big value for businesses. That's where our focus needs to be. That's what we need to be doing as a business. So in order to get into this mode and do this well, we need to set up a product organization that can tackle this. And in order to do that, we need three different pieces. We need a strategy, we need a process, and we need an organization that really supports these two things. So let's start with strategy because that's always where I see organizations fail. Uh, this is, you may be doing process really, really well, but you're gonna just hit a wall if you don't have a strategy. So this is where I like to concentrate on. So I wanna tell you the story about a company that I worked with as an interim um, head of product that was meal kit delivery company quite a few years ago. Uh, the premise of the company is they ship ingredients and recipes to your door. You can open up the box, you know, it comes refrigerated and, uh, or, or cooled down, let's say, and you can cook yourself a delicious meal. So when I came in there, we had a really strong mandate. We were losing uh, acquisition numbers. They were not as high as they used to be. And we knew that we needed to double it in order to achieve our business goals. So we were trying to figure out why are people falling off and why are they not signing up for what we have? And I was running a meeting with a bunch of the teams trying to figure out how we're going to experiment around this when the CTO walks in and he sits down and he says, well, what is your product strategy? And I said, no, we're trying to figure out why people are leaving. We don't have a product strategy yet. We don't know what to build. We don't know why people are leaving. And he goes, no, 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 no. I want a document with every field you intend to put on the site and the content strategy so I can build a back end. He didn't want a strategy. He wanted a plan. And this is what a lot of organizations think a strategy is. What they do is they create wish lists of features that everybody wants. And then they take that wish list and then shove it into a Gantt chart, make up a bunch of dates around it. And then everybody gets upset when you don't have those dates to meet. And what we're failing to recognize here is that creating products is full of uncertainty, creating new features, creating new products. It's characterized by so much uncertainty. And that's what we have to concentrate on. So we need to recognize that product strategy is not a plan. It can't be a plan. 
It needs to account for that uncertainty and allow us the wiggle room to figure out what we need to build. So strategy, what is it if it's not a plan? Strategy is a deployable decision-making framework, enabling action to achieve desired outcomes and constrained by current capabilities coherently aligned to the existing context, which is a huge mouthful. Let's break it down. I love this. I love this definition. It's by Stephen Bungay, who wrote The Art of Action. What we're saying here is that it's a framework that allows the people who are receiving the deployed strategy to make a decision, not telling them what to do, it's allowing them to make decisions about what to do. It enables action to achieve desired outcomes. It lets them take a move. It lets them make a move. And it's oriented towards those outcomes that we like to talk about in product management. It's constrained by current capabilities. We can only do what we can do and then coherently aligned to the existing context where we are now. So in product organizations, this looks something like this. We've got a vision and strategic intent, which make up the business strategy. And these are lofty, right? Visions are about where do we want to be in five to 10 years as a company? How are we differentiating? What's our value for customers? It's not usually just one statement, but a whole write-up of all the things we want to do and where we want to be. Strategic intents are what business challenges are standing in the way of us reaching that vision. Do we need to expand geographically to do that? Do we need to go up market? Do we need to go down market? They encompass everything, not just the product team. And once we're aligned there, then we look at the product portfolio and we say, what problems can we address to tackle the challenge from a product perspective? So what are the big pushes that we're gonna do as product teams to tackle this? And then finally, what options do we have here? What are the different ways I can tackle this and address this to reach my goal? So this is all about what solutions are we going to build to get there? So when he said, what is our product strategy? We didn't actually go out and build this document, the specification document with all those things. Instead, we systematically approached this to figure out what the problem was. So when I came into the organization, they actually had a very clear vision and they had just finished really quantifying and saying how they wanted to be different than other meal kits. So they said in five years, our company will be the meal kit with the most choices and convenience in the market. That's where we were going to win. And then we knew that our strategic intent was doubling acquisition of new customers and maintaining retention by the end of 2016. So now we're aligned around that. And that's what leaders do. Leaders provide the vision goals and guardrails for teams to go after. So we had guardrails. We said we could not play with the price. It would eat into our margins and that wouldn't be good. But we knew that we had options elsewhere. And what that does is it really promotes alignment. We talk a lot about autonomous teams, but you cannot have autonomous teams without alignment. You need to make sure that everybody's swimming in the right direction and moving forward in order to proceed. Otherwise, we're all in motion, but we're going in different directions and you're not going to see the outcomes for your business. So to escape the bill trap, we need to drive high alignment through a good strategy framework that allows the teams to make decisions. And that's also how you scale. You need to allow decision-making at the team level in order to scale your business. But it's not like we just pull this out of a hat. Product strategy actually emerges from experimentation of what we do and how we learn about our customers. So in order to do that, we need a process that allows us to experiment and uncover that uncertainty and lessen it. So that's the second part of this. When I came into the organization, there was tons of ideas of what we could be doing. I was saying, oh, the price is too high. We should lower it. But that was a guardrail. We knew not to go after that. Uh, we also had the VP of marketing saying, we should put a chef's knife in the box. Like people love sign up gifts. That will do it. Putting knives in mailing boxes doesn't sound really safe to me. So we had all these ideas, but the problem was, what is the problem? right? Like what's the problem behind all of these solutions? And they're great ideas. They're fantastic ideas. Everybody had good ones, but we didn't know why people were leaving. We didn't know if this was the right solution. So our team took a step back and evaluated our sign up funnel. And we found out that a lot of people were falling off on a specific step. And coming from e-commerce, I expect them to fall off when they see the price or when they're checking out, but they're falling off in the middle when they entered address. And I was like, that's weird. But with that data, we were able to say, if we can increase our conversion rate by a certain percentage, we can actually double acquisition. And that is what we made into our product initiative. But the question was how, and that rounds out our initiative. We still have to find out what's the problem causing that conversion rate to not be met. So our obstacle is we don't understand why people are leaving our site. 
we're racking our brains. We're trying to figure out why people are leaving. We have no idea. And we can't get in touch with them. We don't have any of their information. So one day my developer comes up and he says, Melissa, uh, I found this thing called Koala Room. And it's a little bit of JavaScript that we put on the page. But as we go towards this back button or as people go to leave, it'll come up and say, hey, what's stopping you from signing up today? I said, that's fantastic. Let's put that up there and see what happens. Took him five minutes to put it up there. And within a week, we had over 2,000 responses. Nobody was saying that they needed a chef's knife. They said, I can't find your food menu. What food do you deliver to me? It's the most basic of things, but they can't find it. They also said, what's in the box? Do I need to buy salt? Do you give me everything? And then also the price is too high. And because we left that open-ended, we were able to see that it was more of a value comparison. Why do you cost more than your competitors? So taking this information, we now know how to act, right? We know what to go after. And we were able to refine that product initiative to say that we needed to create a clearer experience for our customers. That's why they're leaving. They don't understand what we're selling and we didn't do a great job explaining it. So we need to go back and figure out where we're failing. So our next obstacle, we chose that one with the highest percentage and we said, people can't find the menu. So let's figure out how, why. And it did exist. We had a menu page on there, but we had done a big redesign about a year before I got there into really long scroll, flat design, very minimalistic design. And the menu page got hidden under that explore menu. And only 2% of people were actually clicking on it. So we ran an experiment where we took any page that wasn't on the big long scroll page. So we only had FAQs and help, but we said, just let's just see if it works. Took out the menus and put it there and ran a test. And we found that conversion increased like crazy on the small experiment. So we knew which way to go. We ended up breaking down the rest of the pages um, into more explanations and addressing all the issues that we saw. And we iterated on it and rolled it out piece by piece. And by doing that, we were able to actually double our acquisition. So our options became expanded navigation and better explanations on each page. And by systematically going to going through each one of those and reaching that goal, we were able to successfully um, exit the company as well to a large grocery chain, which was a really good outcome for the meal kit delivery company. So to escape the bill trap, we need to use the right processes and tools at the right time. And this is absolutely critical. I see a lot of companies out there just trying to scramble for whatever is a new hotness when it comes to product tools. And a lot of product managers too, not understand the context in which you need to use them. And if I had just written that specification document, we never would have learned why people were leaving our site and we would have still had an acquisition problem. So that's why I want you to remember, tools are useless unless you use them correctly. It doesn't matter if it's a really cool framework, but if you're not using it when it's appropriate, it's not gonna make a difference for you. So that's why I teach people the product kata. And the product kata is exactly what we just went through, breaking down how to get to that overall goal. We start with that company goal, the future KPI or future state, which for us was really those initiatives around conversion rate and then the overall goal around uh, the, the acquisition. We say, what are users doing now? We break it down into the first little goal, our first little goal, looking at that um, strategic intent of doubling acquisition rate was our goal for the product initiative, increasing conversion rate. And then we applied the right tools at the right time to find out what it was that we needed to do on each one of those pages, breaking those down into outcomes as well. So the product kata is great because it really walks you through this process of learning. And what you're doing along the way is learning. You're learning about your customers, you're learning about your business, you're learning about what works and what doesn't work. And learning is the only thing that reduces uncertainty. That's what we need to do as product managers is reduce the uncertainty and the risk around what we are actually going to build. So in order to do that, we need to set up a good discovery and delivery cadence so that our organizations can really learn about our customers and put it back out there and then learn more about what worked and what didn't put it back out there. So we need to set up great organizations that can respond to this. So this becomes critical. If you don't have an organization that really supports the product management processes, it's incredibly hard to do this. It's not impossible. It's just harder to do this. So let's go back and talk about how did we get stuck in the bill trap and why do organizations get stuck in the bill trap frequently? A lot of times we focus more on doing the process right than building the right things. Why? Because it's easy to measure. 
So think about if you are actually doing this in your organization. Instead of measuring these outcomes, we measure outputs. It's easy to go, hey, did we release that? Yes, check. Instead of, hey, did we double acquisition last quarter? Like we have to pull all the data to actually look at that. That's harder, right? Our minds want to go for easy. So what we do is we build and we launch with no measures of success. So we turn to things like velocity to measure success. And we just put it out there and put it out there and feature and feature and feature. And we're never really, really pausing. We're never saying, is this the right thing to build? And in order to really put ourselves back on track, we have to concentrate on making sure we have a direction and those strategic intent so that we are working towards outcomes and the entire business is working towards outcomes. And that's why this part is so critical and why I really stress strategy is a critical part for these organizations. If we don't have a vision and strategic intent to align ourselves around and outcomes to work towards with that, everybody can get sidetracked. So to escape the bill trap, we need to create a product-led organization that has policies and practices needed to navigate uncertainty and make strategic decisions. We need to be embracing discovery work. We need to be allowing for um, experimentation through a good strategy framework and something that's flexible enough for us to change our minds. So great product organizations look like this. They're growing through software products rather than unrepeatable services. They're ruthlessly focused on solving customer and users' problems to drive business value. They're oriented around outcomes instead of outputs. And they're experimental by nature and driven by continuous improvement. And they're a place where leadership enables empowered decision-making throughout all the levels. So once you have an organization set up like that and a strategy to line everybody top to bottom and a process that allows you to experiment around what that strategy should be, getting out of the bill trap really comes down to people. Because I'll tell you right now, it is incredibly comfortable to stay in the bill trap. It's cozy. It's you, like we know how to stay in the bill trap. We know how to do those things. It's easy. So it's up to every one of you to say, are we doing the right things? And does this really matter for our business? And ask the hard questions and take the risk to really get out of the bill trap so that you and your company can thrive. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you would like to buy the book on escaping the bill trap, you can find it on Amazon or anywhere that you buy books. Uh, and also, if you have any questions for me, I have a podcast called Product Thinking uh, Podcast. Please submit your questions to dearmelissa.com and I'd be happy to answer them on the podcast. Um, and if you want the slides, melissa at sendyourslides.com, build trap in the subject line. And I do teach online at productinstitute.com and we would love you to join our classes so that you can be an amazing product manager that escapes the build trap. So thank you very much. Morning.